So uh, now I'm going to tell you a few things you might not have heard about our clinical trial. At this point, we had clear proof of concept with restored vision in two animal species with the exact same biochemical and genetic defects seen in humans. And to me at the time, it seemed a straight shot to FDA approval, and I would have been absolutely wrong. So first, consider the historical context. 20 years ago, gene therapy was a novel concept and was widely viewed with skepticism and suspicion. And the death of Jesse Gelsinger in an early trial had cast a pall over the entire field. The fallout was paralyzing. Investors and pharma companies were scared away from anything gene therapy. A regulatory vice was created to scrutinize every element of a gene therapy trial. I was told repeatedly by CROs and hospital administrators that as the PI, quote, you'll be the one going to jail. Second, they don't teach the basics of drug development in medical school. We had to learn an entirely new language through on-the-job training. There are innumerable regulatory agencies, both intramural and extramural, whose requirements must be met in a specific sequence. These groups are not harmonized, and sometimes they even have conflicting demands. For, exa for example, consider this catch-22. Our IRB insisted that any potentially non-therapeutic dose not be tested, as it would be unethical not to have a prospective benefit in children. However, the Recombinant DNA Advisory Committee, the RAC, insisted that it was a scientific imperative to deliver a non-therapeutic dose in order to establish the minimally effective dose. And yet another agency wanted us to test potentially toxic doses in order to establish the maximum tolerated dose. I myself wanted to be dosed with sedatives when I had to resolve this issue. The FDA, for me, was a black box. I had always assumed it operated like the NIH as far as submission, reviews, and research trials. I even assumed that the two government agencies were somehow linked, and again, I was absolutely wrong. The FDA has an entirely different set of rules than NIH peer-reviewed science. FDA rules are based on federal law, the Code of Federal Regulations. Our preclinical studies had to be repeated in normal, unaffected animals under GLP-certified conditions. This is more accounting than hypothesis-driven science. Biodistribution and toxicity, not efficacy, are the main outcome measures. Though not inspiring work, I do respect the FDA's emphasis on safety first. In order for a drug to be approved in children, the study population must include children. However, the ethics of performing a clinical trial in this vulnerable population is problematic. Typically, the order of preference is adults first. Our application stimulated a presentation on the ethics of phase one pediatric clinical trials at the RAC, immediately after which we were asked to present our proposal. I had taken a crash course in pediatric medical ethics and presented what is the crux of all ethics conversations, the risk-benefit ratio. Fortunately, we had compelling evidence from laboratory studies to demonstrate a prospect for benefit even at low doses of vector. And more importantly, the benefit was likely to be best in children since they had less retinal degeneration. The RAC unanimously approved the protocol, and we were able to include pediatric patients. Which brings me to the consent. I personally consented and assented every patient at our center. During the discussion, I was actually chaperoned by a member of our IRB to make sure I was doing things properly. One unique requirement was to let patients know that they might not like having additional vision, but just in case, we had techniques to blind them again. This surreal product of the Ethics Committee usually brought the conversation to a screeching halt. And then there was the awkward task of explaining to adolescent boys and girls that they were not permitted to conceive children until at least 12 months after treatment. All in all, the consent process took nearly an hour and a half, way longer than the surgery itself. 
Our phase one, two uh, safety trial was sponsored by Children's Hospital Research, and Spark Therapeutics was created years later to fund the phase three efficacy study. Although the phase one study was a safety study, there was overwhelming pressure to show clinical improvement, and we fortunately chose an initial dose which was indeed efficacious in restoring some vision. In addition, we chose an outcome measure, pupillometry, which provided objective evidence for improved function, creating an afferent pupillary defect in the untreated eye. This seemed to me the formula to follow for the phase three or efficacy trial, but again, I was wrong. The FDA, by federal mandate, requires that for a drug to be approved, there must be a demonstration of a clinically meaningful improvement. While some patients showed an improvement in acuity, which is cone vision, the main improvement with this drug is rod mediated. And at the time, there was no recognized outcome measure considered clinically meaningful except three lines of improvement on an EDTRS chart. Pupillometry was not considered clin clinically meaningful. As one reviewer put it, patients care about vision, they don't care about their pupils. And that's absolutely true. So we were essentially assigned the task of creating an entirely new outcome measure. In the phase one, two trial, we had looked at mobility testing, an obstacle course, as an exploratory endpoint. The FDA suggested that this smelled clinically meaningful. Much of the work we did leading up to the phase three, phase three trial centered on developing this into a standardized, statistically rigorous test that would satisfy the FDA. A validation study was done in retinal degeneration and normal subjects. An independent reading center was created to score videos. Files before and after, uh, after surgery were presented in random order. Videos were scrubbed so that light levels could not be recognized. What were we measuring? Not visual acuity. Patients improved on the course without acuity changes. The MLMT measures something clinically meaningful the ability to ambulate in dimmer, dimmer environments, like real-world train platforms, lecture halls, and restaurants. And patients and their family will tell you that this is definitely meaningful. Another thing I did not anticipate was becoming a victim of our early success. Patients wanted in. They all wanted to be in the treatment arm of the phase three trial. However, federal regulations stipulate that there must be an untreated control population, no treatment. We initially proposed dosing everybody in just one eye and using the other eye as an untreated biologic control. However, this is unacceptable on two counts. First, the FDA recognized that if the drug was approved, physicians would inevitably treat both eyes, and they assisted that any trial design reflect this real-life scenario. Reasonable enough. Second, statistical analysis in FDA trials considers subjects, not organs, people, not eyes. We resolved the problem by creating a delayed treatment group. Subjects served as an untreated control for one year, then they crossed over into treatment. A one-year delay was acceptable to patients. The FDA was satisfied. Problem solved. Veretagine Naparvivec, a.k.a. Luxterna, was approved by the FDA almost two years ago, and more recently by the EU. Another thing I did not anticipate, anticipate was the enthusiasm of the advisory boards. Where we had asked in our application to treat children three years and older, they recommended approving the drug for patients as young as one year of age, and that's where it stands now. It's a, it's a peculiar position to be in to be told to do more, not less surgery. So when we began this research, there was no such thing as gene therapy, no clinical trials, no companies, not even laboratory techniques to do retinal gene transfer. Our original LCA team numbered just six people. And now hundreds of patients have undergone subretinal injection in both clinical trials and approved treatment. Gene therapy is a multi-billion dollar business with countless investigators, dozens of startups, several large pharma companies, all employing thousands of people. Gene therapy has definitely arrived. So I'd like to thank the other centers 
in our labor study from Italy and Iowa. And thanks most especially to the pioneers, the patients, who took the risk to be in our original clinical trials. They are the real heroes here. Thank you. Thank you, Gene and Al, for taking us on the journey of both the science and the non-science uh, that basically led to the point where children without any reasonable expectation of useful vision now can have it. This is a monumental achievement, not only for retina, for ophthalmology, but for all of medicine. On behalf of the Scapins International Society and the Academy, I'd like to present each of you with a check to continue that research and to thank you for everything you've done. <laughs>